So today we're going to return to forces and motion and we're going to look now at connected particles. How can particles be connected and what additional forces do we need to consider when they are? I'm going to start with this simple situation. Two people are pulling on a rope from two opposite ends. Where is the tension? Where is the tension in this rope? We know that the force within a string, a rope, or a chain is going to be tension. The force within a flexible connector is always going to be tension. But what direction is it in, and how do we model it? Well, tension will always be moving in the opposite direction to the force it is a reaction to. So, let's get back to the twins. Both of the twins are pulling. On the left-hand side, I'll label that as a red pull force and on the right hand side a blue pull force. Where is the tension? Each of them is pulling and each of them can feel the pull of the other twin. The twin on the left hand side we've labelled with a red pull. Well the twin on the right hand side can feel that and for the twin on the right hand side that is going to be tension. This tension force is a reaction to the right hand twin also pulling. If the right hand twin let go of the string, even though the left hand twin is pulling, there would be no tension. Similarly, there is tension on the left hand side. It's the reaction to the left hand twin pulling. If the left hand twin let go of the string, there would be no tension. Now, whenever we produce a model in mechanics or a diagram, we try our best to hone in, to focus in on just one object at a time. So if we were concentrating on the twin on the right hand side, we would only consider these forces. The pull force that this twin is producing and the reaction force, which is the tension. Similarly, we can focus in on the twin on the left hand side and we would only consider these two forces, the pull force and the tension reaction force. Okay, so to summarize, tension is the force in a string, rope, chain, or even a rod that works against a pull. So whenever one object is pulling another, or is just pulling in general, the force in the rope, string, chain, or rod is going to be tension. Okay, so let's move on to a more practical example that is going to involve tension. So when we look at connected particles, this is one of the most popular scenarios or context to the question. We have one object that is going to be pulling another. So here we have a car that is pulling a trailer loaded with multiple quad bikes. Now, I wouldn't expect you to ever draw a car or a trailer in a diagram that you're producing, but we'll simplify that down to boxes. So these two boxes are going to represent that car and trailer. And I'll just change the size so we can actually label them correctly. Now, if the mass of the car was 500 kilograms, and the mass of the trailer, let's say it has multiple quad bikes, is 800 kilograms. We need to consider all of the forces that are acting on each of these individual objects. So let's go about labeling our diagram. So firstly, we choose the direction of motion. This is the positive direction for our calculations. The direction of motion is off to the left. The car will be driving towards the left. We'll add some forces. The driving force from the car's engine is a force that is moving in the positive direction, moving to the left. And we'll say it's 700 newtons. Because these particles are connected, that means if the car moves to the left, then the trailer is also being pulled to the left. And that pulling force is tension. We'll label that as T. So the trailer itself doesn't have any additional forces that are making it move to the left. It doesn't have an engine of its own. It is only moving to the left because it is connected to the car. Which other forces might we have? Well, on the car, there may be resistive forces. Let's say 80 newtons of resistance. The question will often just tell you summarily that the resistive forces are a certain value. That means it includes the friction it includes air resistance, they've summed them together and it's 80 newtons. 
there's a resistive force that might exist on the trailer, this time around 120 newtons. And there is an additional resistive force that is acting on the car. It's the resistive force that's being produced because it's connected to the trailer. The car would have an easier time of moving if it wasn't connected to the trailer. The fact that the trailer is attached to it is slowing it down or meaning it needs more force to move forwards. So the two tensions we have, one of them is the driving force on the trailer and one of them is a resistive force on the car. Two tensions acting within the connection, they would always be in opposing directions and we'll revisit the reason for that later. Now, the things that are unknown about this situation at the moment are the actual value for the tension and the acceleration of the system, the acceleration of each of the bodies involved. Now, we can find those two unknowns if we can produce two sensible equations. Let's start by focusing in on the car. So, only considering the forces that are touching the car, we're going to apply Newton's second law. So, F equals MA. We want the resultant force, and that should equal mass times acceleration. The resultant force is going to be all the forces in the positive direction subtract all the forces in the negative direction. We're going to get 700 subtract 80 subtract T, and that equals mass of 500 times acceleration. We can tidy it up a bit, and here's our equation. Moving on to the second body. Once again, we can apply Newton's second law. We're only going to consider the forces that are touching, that are in contact with this body. So the resultant force, positive direction, subtract negative direction, gives us T minus 120. And that should equal the mass of 800 times the acceleration. Okay, we now have two useful equations. Both of them have two unknowns, T and A. Let's put them over here. And what I want you to recognize, and you should always get this situation, is that we have a negative T and a positive T. We have the negative and positive tension because our two tensions were moving in different directions. This allows us to use the next step with simplicity. If we just add these two equations together, we immediately eliminate T. So adding the left-hand sides, we would have 620 minus T, plus t minus 120. That gets us 500. If we add together the right-hand sides, we get 1,300a. And now we're one step away from finding an expression for the acceleration. It applies to 5 over 13. I'm sure you can anticipate what's going to happen next. Now that we have the acceleration, we can substitute into one of the previous equations and we can solve for the tension. So rearranging and solving, to three significant figures, we get tension of 428 newtons. So, when we're working with connected particles, we want to produce a well-labeled diagram, and then we'll consider one body at a time, and we'll apply Newton's second law to produce a motion equation. From there, we generate simultaneous equations where the t's cancel out nicely. Substituting a back in, we can find t. Most questions around this are going to ask you to find acceleration and tension. Regardless of the order the question has asked you to find these, you should go ahead and use this technique to find both of them at the same time. You may well be answering part A and part B of a question, but this technique will always get you these two values. Now, I hope it goes without saying that now that you've found the acceleration, you have the link, you have the root, between Newton's second law and false diagrams and constant acceleration SUVAT equations. So a question may start as a SUVAT question and then bring you into using Newton's second law with connected particles, or it may start with a connected particles question, false diagram, and take you over to a SUVAT constant acceleration question. Okay, so let's just return back to the original context. And here we need to discuss something quite crucial. While the car was moving, it didn't actually matter whether this was connected by a rope or by a tow bar. They would have both been modeled the same way and both of them would have produced tension. 
But if the car starts to slow down, then it is massively important whether or not we have a tow rope or a tow bar. What difference would it make? If we have a tow bar, when a car starts to slow down, the tow bar maintains the distance between the car and the trailer. It's a rigid bar made of metal. It keeps the trailer the same specific distance away from the car. If instead we had a tow rope, what would happen as the car slowed down? The car's arrived at a red light. What's going to happen to the trailer when the car slows down? Well, the trailer is going to maintain its momentum. The car may be slowing down, but the trailer itself is going to continue forward and obviously we're going to have an accident. So as you can see from the cinema grade animation that a tow rope is actually a more dangerous solution to towing a vehicle than a tow bar. A tow bar is a safety device. Let's consider what happens when we do have a tow bar. The force within the tow bar when the system is decelerating is no longer going to be tension. It's going to be thrust. So let's just remodel. We're going to get our diagram with our two objects, our connection. This is going to be connected by a rod and we'll start to relabel. So we'll keep the masses the same. We're still moving in the same direction. Here's the original forces that we had. If we're slowing down, the model changes. There is no longer a force coming from the engine. And as I said, we don't have tension in the connecting rod. What forces do we additionally have? Although the resistive forces remain the same. Which additional forces do we have? Well, if the engine isn't driving us forward, we're likely to actually have a braking force. As a car comes to a red light, it applies the brakes, which is a force that's acting in the opposite direction to the direction of motion. Let's say we have a braking force of 1000 newtons. The trailer doesn't have anything that is slowing it down at the moment. The trailer wants to continue moving with the same momentum. So the trailer actually ends up pushing into the car. This is why this force is now thrust and it's pointing in this direction. It's pointing towards the car. It's acting towards the car. And at the very same time, the car in front is producing a resistive force. It's maintaining the distance, so it's pushing back into the trailer. So here we're labeling this as thrust. Obviously the same initial as tension, but the direction of the arrows we use are now opposite. If you want to convince yourself, just imagine you and your friend are running down the corridor and there's a broomstick in between you. You're balancing, maintaining a broomstick in between your back and your friend's chest. So you're maintaining exactly the same distance. If the person in the front was to slow down without warning, what would happen? The person behind isn't aware that the person in front is slowing down and they're going to push into the broomstick, which will push into your back. At the very same time, the broomstick is pushing into their chest. That's what's happening here with the rod. It's pushing into each of those two bodies. So let's go ahead and use the same technique we used before. We're going to apply Newton's second law to each of these bodies. So focusing in on all of the forces that are connected to the car. The resultant force, we have negative 80, negative 1000, positive T. That's the resultant force. And that's going to equal 500 A. Tidying that up, negative 1080 plus T equals 500 A. Moving on to the second body, the trailer. Forces in the positive direction, we don't have any. We have negative T minus 120 equals 800 A. These are the two equations that we want to work with. Once again, we have a positive value for t and a negative value for t. Add together the left-hand sides, add together the right-hand sides. Acceleration is going to simplify to negative 12 over 13. And obviously this is actually deceleration. Okay, now that we've got a value for a, we can substitute back in and get a value for t. The thrust is going to be 618 
newtons. Okay, so here you just have to be really careful that you're actually following the context of the question. Once again, you need to engage in the scenario, in the story, in the context to know whether or not your connected particles were accelerating or decelerating. And as always, this all starts with a well laid out diagram. Is it well constructed? Is it well labeled? Is it legible? The make or break in every connected particle question is whether or not you've produced a good diagram. Now I have said you should always consider one object or one body at a time. On the very rare occasion, sometimes it is useful to look at this all as one system. So looking throughout the whole diagram, we would find a resultant force with all the forces moving in the positive direction, subtract all the forces moving in the negative direction, and we'll put that equal to mass times acceleration. That's a rare occurrence which may once in a while be useful, but this is the standard approach. And in the next few lessons, we'll see that this is actually the only option that we have if the particles are moving in different directions. But for now, I'll let you get started on some practice questions.